Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to Ukraine Post-Conflict Strategies. Thank you very much for coming. I'm John Chorchari. I'm the co-director of the International Policy Center here at the Ford School. Uh, I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Center for Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies, and also the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies, uh, both at the university's International Institute. I want to thank Will Lamping, who's an MPP student here at the Ford School, and also our IPC administrator, Thea Rowe, for helping to pull this uh, event together and organize it. I'm joined by a distinguished panel. They're going to discuss the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, some of the challenges that stem from the conflict, such as needs for reconstruction, uh, resettlement, and demobilization uh, in the event uh, that the conflict uh, winds down, or even if it continues, and the roles of major external powers. Uh, I'll introduce them with one-line biographies. You can see much more about their impressive backgrounds uh, on the website. Uh, Ronald Suny, the William H. Sewell, Jr. Distinguished University Professor of History here at the University of Michigan will lead off. Then we'll have Yaroslav Ritsak, Professor of History at the Ukrainian Catholic University and Lviv National University. Third will be Yuri Zhukov, an Assistant Professor of Political Science, also here at the University of Michigan. And last but not least, our own Ambassador Mel Levitsky, who is a Professor of International Policy and Practice here at the Ford School. Panelists are going to start by giving brief remarks. Uh, while they do, if you have questions, please write them down on the note cards that were handed out to you as you entered, and please pass them to one of our team members in the aisles who will walk along these sides and, and make themselves known with a show of hands. Um, they will then bring the cards down to me and to Will Lamping, uh, and we'll, ask, uh, we'll do our best effort to ask a representative a sample of your questions to the panel. So without further ado, let's welcome our panelists and get started. Thank you, John. Thank you all for coming. This is, should be a very interesting evening indeed. Uh, my task is, uh, Will is my student and my TA, and he gave me this task. Basically, I'm going to try to explain what does Putin want, Russia, and the crisis in Ukraine. In a real sense, in my view, the Soviet Union did not collapse in a single moment of catastrophic, colossal disintegration in 1991. In my view, it's still collapsing. The fibers, the networks, the integrated populations, the diasporas, the discourses and understandings that held the largest country on the globe together are still in the process of fraying and unraveling as the current war, war in Ukraine uh, shows. Conflicting uh, ideas of ethnicity, nationality, of disputed histories, of how coherent the Slavic world is, Nationalizing efforts by those dedicated to building a new independent Ukrainian state and nation. And anxieties by Russia and Russians of their geopolitical and cultural vulnerability. All these together have lethally combined in a toxic mix that has exploded into open warfare. Thousands have died. More thousands have been wounded, crippled, displaced from their homes, their lives turned upside down. Old anxieties and uh, attitudes, emotional attitudes and uh, uh, views towards friends and enemies, however, remain. In my view, you can take Russia and the Ukraine out of the Soviet Union, but you can't take the Soviet Union out of Russia and the Ukraine. So how did the world get into this mess? It's a fascinating question. And I think, to be very crude, there are two major narratives, master narratives, one more dominant in the West and one in Russia. In the Western narrative, the events on Maidan two years ago were a democratic revolution, people rising up to resist corruption and dictatorship, a reach by ordinary people for freedom, independence, and a closer alliance with Europe. In this view, Ukrainians yearned for a better life and saw the possibility for that life in closer relations with the West. There was, in this view, very little genuine support for the rebellion in eastern uh, Ukraine, which was largely an artificial calamity encouraged and supported by Russia. So it is Russia that, uh, uh, that is the sole per uh, perpetrator of the conflict, given its support for the former president of Ukraine, uh, Yanukovych, and later, of course, when it brazenly annexed Crimea and invaded Ukraine. <clears throat> 
Thus, the Western, in the Western view, the crisis is largely the creation and responsibility of Putin and the Russians. The Russians, of course, have their own counter-narrative. What happened there, in their view, is a coup d'etat was carried out in Kiev, orchestrated by the West, particularly the United States, and influenced by fascists. Within Ukraine, there was real genuine opposition to Maidan and to this rise of fascism. This was particularly strong in Donetsk and Luhansk, where genuine, spontaneous, grassroots resistance to the illegitimate regime in Kiev exploded in deadly warfare, largely because of Ukrainian government and paramilitary aggression. Russia has played, in its view, a supporting and largely humanitarian role in protecting the independence and freedom of eastern Ukraine. Now, there are variants and versions of this, less crude than the ones that I've, I've mentioned. I was particularly taken by the views of my friend and fellow historian Timothy Snyder, who indeed believes that this is more than just a, a clash between Russia and Ukraine. It is indeed a clash of civilizations. Uh, that is, Putin is out to destroy Europe, the European Union. In an especially egregious misuse of history, uh, Snyder uh, equates Putin with Stalin's actions during the infamous Nazi Soviet period. Just as Stalin sought to turn the most radical of European forces, uh, Adolf Hitler, against Europe itself, so Putin is allying with his grab bag of anti-European populists, fascists, and separatists. His allies on the far right are precisely the political forces that wish to bring an end to the current European order, the European uh, Union, unquote. Uh, I subscribe to the John Stewart School of Hitterology, of Naziology. That is, John Stewart said wisely, let's all agree that the only thing we're going to call Hitler is Hitler. So I don't think these are very helpful kinds of uh, analogies. Now, um, what is this Russian narrative, and what, how can one flesh it out? And it seems to me we can find a lot in Putin himself to try to explain what indeed he is about. Um, uh, Vladimir Putin has several sort of big um, elements in his general narrative. And they go back, of course, to the late Soviet period and indeed to the Yeltsin period. You can find many of the things that Putin is saying in the Yeltsin period as well, but they weren't acted on. Russia was still weak, Russia was closer to the West, and Putin didn't act on many of these things. One is that Russia is Velikia Dzerzhava. It's a great power, and it should be treated like a great power. And therefore, the second element that he worries about is that the, Russia has not been given its due. It's not adequately respected by its European and American partners. And in February 2007, in his speech at the Munich Conference on Security Power, he put this quite bluntly. Sometimes his speech is called the introduction to a new Cold War. Uh, Putin was upset by the United States' uh, emergence as the single hyperpower or unipower in the world. And he's against this idea of unipolarity. He rejected the notion uh, that force could be used internationally if it were simply sanctioned by NATO or the European Union and proposed instead that the only legitimation for armed force against another state was through the UN which, of course, the United Nations, where he would have a veto. Another point in, in the armor of Putin is a new confidence that wasn't there in Yeltsin's years. The new wealth, as well as American overextension of its capabilities, enabled the Putin administration to embark on a more assertive policy independent of what the United States might prefer. You could say that Putin's foreign policy closely mirrored his domestic politics. If, if anything, there are three elements to that. Statism, realism, and increasingly nationalism. His international policy was the corollary of his domestic policy. Stronger state, preservation of the present internal di distribution of power, economic prosperity, though too little investment in the future, stability and continuity, most importantly. Putin has made it clear, though people in the West often miss this, 
that he does not want to restore the Soviet Union. His foreign policy, in his view, is not imperialist or expansionist. Rather, it is about having stability and, I would argue, regional hegemony in the near abroad, the countries around his own country. Regional hegemony, security, stability. He's not a radical. He was ready to deal with any kind of regime, no matter how noxious. Think of his relations with Assad. So in his view, and actually in my view as well, Moscow's policies can be interpreted to preserve existing influences in the region for the purpose, in his view, of greater stabilization rather than imperial control. The Kremlin is driven by these ideas of security and stability because of its own sense of vulnerability, of its own weakness. Russia's foreign policy cannot be understood if you just look at Russia or just look at the Ukrainian-Russian conflict. It has to be understood in the larger international context, looking at the entire international arena. I mentioned its general weakness, its vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis the West, and the global ambitions of the single superpower in the world, the United States. Russian realism contrasts with and has to learn to live with the liberal internationalism and often liberal interventionism of the American government, which has been particularly evident for the last two decades. While Russia aims for a regional hegemony in the so-called near abroad, the United States, most forcibly under George W. Bush, uh, has promoted its own ambitions for global hegemony and the active prevention of any rival hegemon from rising and establishing its influence over any region. American foreign policy, as many of us know, has been largely ideological, driven by a vision of the world in which security can be achieved only by creating a benign world of democratic capitalist states with Western values of tolerance civil rights, and economic individualism. American leaders believe that America has a special positive role to play in world affairs. That is, in the words of Madeleine Albright, we are the indispensable nation. Its own vision of its own unique position privileges its own freedom of action. For American interests are seen to be magically consonant with those of other peace-loving states. In this vision, Russia, then, is constructed as materialistic, venal, self-interested, anti-democratic, naturally authoritarian, and expansionist. She is simply an international mischief maker. The Russians, of course, think they've been cheated, that they've been uh, neglected, and even they've been lied to by the West, most importantly on the issue of NATO. When Gorbachev negotiated in negotiations around the unification of East and West Germany, uh, he agreed to withdraw Soviet troops from the countries of the Warsaw Pact with assurances, at least he thought so, that East Germany would not be militarized and, as Secretary of State Baker promised him on February 9, 1990, there would be no extension of NATO's jurisdiction one inch to the east, unquote. German Foreign Minister Genscher told Edward Shevardnadze, one thing is certain, NATO will not expand to the east. But of course they did. Promises were made, not only uh, were other countries brought into NATO, largely because they really wanted to be in it, but to other Soviet republics, notably Georgia and Ukraine, that eventually they too would gain uh, eventual membership. NATO in expansion was not seen as Russia as a benign act, of course. It's seen by many of its members, however, as enhancing their security. I wonder about that. I wonder, in fact, by bringing those countries into NATO, we haven't, in fact, created a serious security dilemma. By increasing one side's security, NATO is then seen offensive by the other side, by the Russians, who then have to react by increasing their security, sometimes through reckless acts. While the West saw its moves eastward as benign and non-threatening, we know that the Kremlin felt that the West thought and acted as if its interests alone were legitimate, never considering whether Russia would see the movement of a potentially hostile military alliance closer to its borders, indeed into the former Soviet space, as a serious threat to its national security. These ideas, as I say, go back as far as Yeltsin, but Putin is the one who's acted upon it. 
and he acts from Russian weakness. He knows that the U European Union is 12 times larger economically than Russia. The United States, 13 times larger. China, twice the size. America's defense spending, greater than all other nations combined. And NATO's, 70% of which is financed by the United States, is 10 times larger than Russia. Yet despite his weakness, Putin repeatedly stated that Russia, a nuclear armed state, must be taken seriously by the West. What he wanted in Ukraine, I believe, was a neutral, benign Ukraine that would be friendly to Russia. And he almost got it before the fall of Yanukovych. But then he did certain things which, in my view, were neither realistic, were impulsive, and were reckless. By, by if you wanted a, a Ukraine that was, in fact, pro-Russian or neutral, what you don't do is annex part of its, its territory. The Crimea thing, which was done quickly, without a wide uh, consultation, in fact, changed the whole game. The European security system was changed. We are now in this deep crisis. Thank you. Yeah, here you can have it. Uh, since the beginning of Ukrainian events, I have been traveling intensively, both to West and East, and I, there's rarely three days in a row where I'll be staying at the same place, more also in the same bed. So I'm thank you so much for inviting me here because it provides me with luxury. I stayed in Ann Arbor for the for five days. So actually, this is kind of achievement. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I would like to use this opportunity to, some, to, to say, to share some, some some of my thoughts, because basically why I'm moving that much, not because of the, so to say, the political current situation, but also I wonder, as an intellectual and historian, trying to make sense of it, so to say. And so therefore, we have to be both here and there. So I've been to Donetsk, been to Donbass, been to Kyiv, to been to Warsaw, to been to Brussels, now I am in Ann Arbor. And my impression, general impression, is that he have no chances to make sense of this calamity, so to say. And the first thing is why it could not make sense because it's unprecedented. This is my first point. Even the way we define this war as a hybrid war says you a lot, because basically it's another way to say it's an unprecedented war, something we have for the first time, or probably one of the first times, so to say. My idea is here, so my point, that we have any, any kind ready, we don't have any kind of book we could grab from the shelf and to read to get some kind of idea, to get a sense of the, of the events. More so, we even don't have a vocabulary to speak about these events, because we back basic concepts. One example we'll do, and here we'll probably come to my major point. There is a new concept that emerged recently in the social scientists, probably you know this concept, so-called precariat. This is the concept which was launched by the British social scientist Guy Standing. It's about a very global phenomenon. I believe many people here sitting here, they are precarious, so they never realize they are belong to this class. It's a basically describes some kind of a new emerging class, which is global. It is mostly people who are have by their, uh, say, by their uh, objective data, by their educational level, by their skills, by their values, they belong to the middle class. But throughout their academic careers or any careers, they have no chances, say, to be secure, so they're more closely in the senses to proletariat. So they have very precarious position, so to say. And this is quite a new phenomenon which is global. And say, occupying the Wall Street is very much about, about that. We have a recent discussion about this phenomenon in Poland. And there are many people who are discussing this idea and they say this lastly is invented, has nothing to do with current political situation. But then you had in Poland political uh, presidential elections and turned out to be that this specific class, which is precariat, decided, determined the outcome of the elections, so to say because they basically they failed the current president of Komorowski. And now, but nowadays, in, in Poland, nobody already discusses this concept of precariat because it's, it's, taken, it's taken for granted. It's, it's there. Basically, it's a class which is very much like generation. Or as a, as a, as a words, they say, tell me the year you have been born, I'll tell you how poor you will be. So this is the whole idea about this class. So my point is that in many senses, what happened in Ukraine related exactly to this term, to precariat. Just give you one idea, one data. Ukraine nowadays belongs to the top most educated countries in the world. 
number of the people who are after the high school entering the universities unbelievably high, approximately 80%, even more than Israel. I'm not saying they have good education, education is unbelievably bad, as they call it, quality, but quantity, this which amazed her. And basically, they're going to the university not because of, say, or some kind of the idea they're getting knowledge, because they basically, they, they're hiding from unemployment, so to say. So this is what you have there. You have a people, young generation, in March, the last 25 years, we have no perspective for the future. And increasingly so, under this extremely corruptive regime, and increasingly such corruptive regime as, as, as Yanukovych. So in my understanding, to, very, to, very, to a large extent, I'm not saying this is the, the only definition, Ukrainian Evermaidan was revolution of this class, of these young people. I could go and on with some characteristic, probably come with discussion, because there are several papers on this, because we make some surveys on that view, especially on values, because values are very important. It's not just as kind of some, 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 some ideological uh, missed term, because you could measure some values, you could see this kind of the differences between the older and younger, younger generation in Ukraine. So uh, what I'm saying here, that if you, when I'm going back, if you think that you, War, or European Maidan, Euro Maidan, and the war which ensued is about nation, nationalism, identities, you are wrong. It's not about that. It's exactly how Putin wants to see it. It's about nation building, empire, things like that. It's not about that. It's about changes. It's about modernization. It's about the chances for the people who live there. This is important, essential for me, this point to, point, 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 point to make. Because we're using all vocabulary of empire, building, national, building, things like that. And it's, I believe it exactly the Putin believes these things. Because he's misjudging Ukraine. He still believes that Ukraine is a divided country, then Huntington works there, clash of civilization kind of talks, and things like that. And this is nonsense. You be, have to be in Ukraine, you have to travel to Ukraine to see the sociology, you have to give surveys, you could see this is, don't, really, don't, don't really matter. So what really matters is corruption. This is the higher point. Security and corruption is the highest point. Nobody talks about language nowadays that more, about historical memory, about Mandela, all this kind of rubbish, excuse me for saying that we've been talking before, before, before the things. So basically, this is, my, this is my point. You have to get this, if you change this view, you, you're not saying that you understand Ukraine, but you start understanding better what it at stake. My second point, at large extent, Putin was, uh, Putin was, uh, uh, has to pay for this mistake, for this ignorance. Because basically, uh, if he would be right, if he would be right, his project of the Russian Spring would be successful. Again, here I might point more point uh, with uh, discontent with Professor Ronsuni. Uh, the Russian scenario toward Ukraine, uh, it, Putin, I don't believe, worked on impulsive makes a decision on impulsive way. Because Russian scenario, possible Russian scenario, Ukrainian scenario, toward Russian scenario over Ukraine, it's called Ukrainian scenario, has been already elaborated in 2009, a year after Georgia. And there has been a lot of analysis, there has been publication on these lines. If you look at the publication of 2009, and you look at like what was going on there at the UN, you will see this is kind of carbon copy, what was there. Basically, the whole idea was of Putin, if Ukraine would move to West, and it was not talk about NATO, again, it's very important, it's talk about the European Union, Agreement with the European Union, which has no kind of commitments. It's a technical agreement. But it was considered from the point of view as a kind of threat of the strategic interest of Russia. So what the strategy says, if this Ukraine would move west, there is a plan of, say, of disintegrating Ukraine in two parts. I, I will clone the axis Kharkiv-Odessa. To tell you more for your knowledge of Ukraine, it goes about the industrial heart of Ukraine. Nepropetrovsk, Zaporozhye, the most educated, the most industrialized, the most urbanized large regions of Ukraine, which also, which is very important, have access to the wall, to the Black Sea. So, in this sense, if Ukraine wants to go to Europe, it could go, but a smaller, on a smaller scale, like a weak state, agricultural state, not really developed, with the West, Galicia, the kind of, that kind of thing. This was strategy, at least it was, was being elaborated in 2009. I know that because I was, at that time, during Maidan, I was working closely in the Poroshenko team, and we already knew that, in uh, December of nine, what is uh, December 14, 13, excuse me, at the first weeks of uh, uh, Maidan, what is coming. Um, most of the people in the Poroshenko milieu uh, knew that it's not Yanukovych who is the main danger. It's uh, yeah, uh, Putin who is the main danger. They know what is coming. What is coming in the when, when Maidan would be would succeed. So I'm telling you, it's a long-term game. It's something different again game. But I believe still, it's a game scenario which is based on a very wrong presumption.
that identity matters, Ukraine is divided, Russian language matters, and like that. So once Putin won't enter Crimea, all the other Russian-speaking part would meet Russian army with flowers. And never happened. So basically, I would say Putin was punished for his failure of the Russian war, of Russian spring, because basically what you got here as a result of Russian spring is Donbass only, not even Donbass, it's one third part of Donbass. This is real territory when the Russian spring has been, has been, has been, has been shrinked. That said, that said, I don't claim that Putin has claimed, failed completely, no. In a large extent, to some extent, or to a large extent, his Putin has been uh, successful because by imposing the war on Ukraine, and this is imposed on war, I believe, giving the, this perspective, long-term perspective, uh, it's still a chance for Ukrainian modernization. And it's basically what the revolution was about. Because for him, uh, the modernization of Ukraine, introducing radical political and more so economical reforms is a, is a threat. I would say a little threat, because otherwise he used legitimacy for providing his politics, for keeping this kind of ideology, or whatever he says, the, the, the articulation of the Ruski Mir, which is another word, is nothing else but to claim as a kind of third Zonderweg, a Zonderweg which is basically to say that this is accepted as a failure of the Russian organization. Again, there is very interesting study done by a Polish scholar who tried to compare, to analyze uh, Medvedev and Putin discourses by their presidents. So what was interesting in this case that a core element or a central term for Medvedev was modernization in his public speeches and appearances. The core uh, element or central element in Putin was security. So see what has happened there. Basically, this is, should say, denial or say refusal to make any kind of modernization and call it Zonderbeck, Ruski Mir, all this kind of, excuse me, ideological mist or trash, which some people keep as a by, the, by, by, by face value. So by imposing war on Ukraine, Putin to a certain extent steals the chance for Ukraine for reforms and, which I have to admit, it also provides Ukrainian government, which is very inefficient and corrupted, for a very convenient excuse not to do reforms. Because once you have a war, it's very hard to, co co to, do, to, 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 to embark on embark reforms. And this is actually what Yatsenyuk uses in his, in his speeches. He basically says it's an issue nowadays. It's, a, it's not about reform, it's about survival of Ukraine. And I would say it's a suicidal, suicidal politics because it plays in the hands of, 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 of Kremlin. This is a very short term. It's not even a strategy. It's a tactics because we're losing this kind of big picture. So uh, uh, what could be suggested or anything? I know what time is running. Let me check here. So I'll probably have four minutes. I'll try to put be as brief as short. I believe to a large extent Ukraine well, has, missed, has lost this chance for the radical reforms because the window opportunity was very short. The window opportunity was about a year or so. I mean, there was much expectations. There were very strong social, su st rather strong social support throughout Ukraine I'm talking about on the basis on the, on the, on the uh, surveys that we did. Now it's lost. I know it's lost completely, but it's lost. Let's forget it. I don't believe that Ukraine, refor Ukraine would go with uh, radical reforms, successful reform. Even so, even so, Poroshenko now claims that he will start this reform and he was using the Saakashvili as a kind of the support, additional support. But I believe, again, it's, it's, it's probably it's too little and too late, so to say. So basically, uh, we are now entering in Ukraine in the long-term period of crisis, of political crisis, of political instability, and this is a very bad story. Without economic reforms, I'm sorry to tell to sell, to tell that. So the results are rather unpredictable. So that said, I also have to say that Ukraine, for Ukraine, the window of opportunity is closed. But what I do believe that still. You have Ukraine, Ukraine has a corridor, so to say. A new corridor, a long way to go. It's like a 20, 25 years. And my calculation, or my expectations, call it naive or not, is based on two new phenomena which are evident in Ukraine. First is the younger generation. What probably the main advantage of Ukraine since the last 25 years is the young generation. You may call, you may, What's what professors have put it, put it nicely. You may take Soviet Union and Ukraine from the Soviet Union, but you cannot Soviet Union and Ukraine. You can take it when you talk about younger generation. But there's not that much Soviet about them. They don't remember the Soviet things. And it's also I'm talking about the basically on the social, on the social service, the way they behave, the thing like, the thing like that, so to say. So uh, what I'm saying here that since 
this is people who nowadays in the age of 18 to 29, you have to provide them with a chance to get older, say, for the next 20 some years when they'll be in the age, middle age. And this is the period when the people on this age take responsibility for the country. And I believe there's a chance that one of these people would be in this age, this may be a new country nowadays. So they have a, Ukraine is not a sprinter, not a star. It goes a long run, slowly, to say, but rather, rather, rather surely. Whether it will happen will depend on many uh, circumstances, uh, which I could not predict. But, and here's coming to my final point, the West support is very important. Because we have to think differently about Ukraine. Because if you think about, again, about nationalism, imperialism, things like that, you're losing the point. You're losing this issue of this new phenomenon. And my second phenomenon is a civil society, which is thriving in Ukraine. Because without the society, believe me or not, Ukraine would collapse in the first year of the of the of the of the of the of the uh, Russia of the Donbas Donbas uh, military uh, military uh, uh, war. Because basically, it was them who provided the main support, the main the the, the deliver the, the deliver main main uh, goods, whatever for the soldiers and officers. Because not because of just patriotic duties, because they were their son, daughter, sons, brothers, uh, husband, things like that. This this you have to be you have to be there. So I'm ending to. We need, really need a strategy. We really need a strategy for, to, take, to, to, take this, to, to, help this, to help this change. But to have a strategy, we have to think differently. And to think differently, we have the new vocabulary. Thank you so much. While we pull up uh, our next speaker's slide deck, let me remind you, please, if you think got questions you'd like to ask, write them down, and please prepare to pass them over to the aisles where we'll have folks to collect them. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you, John, for inviting me to be on this uh, very distinguished panel and to uh, talk to all of you about such an important topic. Uh, and although the title of our, uh, of our panel and the theme is ostensibly post-conflict strategies, uh, I'm actually going to argue that it's premature for us to talk about that because um, I think the conflict is still very much ongoing. It has partially frozen. It has quieted down. But there are bullets still flying. And in fact, just this morning, the OSCE sent out um, a report about a sharp increase in ceasefire violations. And a lot of this has had to do with um, those of you who have been following Ukrainian politics uh, may know that last week. Um, I believe the head of a Ukrainian political party, uh, uh, Gennady Kurban, the head of Ukrop, was arrested by Ukrainian authorities. And after this arrest, some of his supporters, about 1,000 of them, including about 300 uh, right sector militants, uh, protested in Dnipropetrovsk, after which uh, the OSCE saw some of these groups, uh, along with units of some volunteer battalions, including Azov and Sich, uh, they took up firing positions. Uh, they deployed to the northwest of Donetsk, which is where a lot of um, uh, ceasefire violations, mainly small arms fire and explosions have uh, across the line of control have happened. And the reason I'm telling you this, and I'm going to come back to this in the end, is that this episode underscores just how fragile uh, the recent reduction in violence has been. Uh, so overall, the level of fighting in the Donbass has dramatically decreased since a high of about 396, I believe, um, <clears throat> individual unique incidents of violence per week in, in January to about only a couple dozen last month. Uh, but what we have now is these third party groups, these spoilers, um, that are using ceasefire violations or threats of ceasefire violations. By the way, on both sides, they're using these kinds of violations as leverage on the government. In this case, to respond to what they thought was a selective application of justice. Uh, but it does underscore just how fragile um, the current situation is and how easily um, we can return back to the violence of, of previous months. Now, this conflict has gone on for about 18 months. Uh, I want to begin by showing you how, this, how the violence has unfolded uh, since uh, Yanukovych's departure in uh, February of 2014. And these are some of the data that my research team and I, uh, some of whom are in the audience tonight, have been collecting. So for, uh, as you see, the, uh, this is a, an animation. It, this shows uh, rebel violence. Uh, this does not include political protests. So during much of 
March of last year, uh, there were a lot of what was initially peaceful protests, which had escalated to the seizure of government buildings throughout the Donbas, uh, the seizure of police stations, and eventually the several towns falling under rebel control. Um, and then in the beginning of May, May 11th, rebels held uh, what the Ukrainian government called a pseudo-referendum on independence and on the creation of the so-called People's Republic of Donetsk and Luhansk. And as you see, those gray areas are the territories that the, that the, the rebels controlled at that point. And there are flare-ups of violence throughout this area. The Ukrainian government initially hesitated in responding to it, but then in mid-July, uh, mid they sent four battalions, or actually four brigades, to sweep that southern border area to restore control over the border, uh, border crossings. And then in, in, um, in the middle of, J of July, the 95th uh, Air Assault uh, uh, Brigade of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, which is the most capable unit that they have, carried out this massive artil um, armored raid in which they basically split this whole territory in half and, and, and broke the front. And at that point, it kind of looked like the rebels were finished. And then the Russians uh, intervened militarily. There was an, an armored uh, assault down in the south, ex extending the reach of their territory over to the border of Zaporozhye. Uh, they eventually had to pull back because they outran their logistics. They also trapped a large concentration uh, of Ukrainian troops in a, in a pocket around, um, around Ilovaisk. Um, and then in, uh, af after uh, <coughs> September 5th, there was a first Minsk ceasefire agreement, which is what you're seeing right now. There's technically a ceasefire on the ground. As you can see, it is not holding. The line of control is relatively static at this point. Uh, the fighting has evolved into kind of static defensive warfare, kind of think Western Front of World War I. Um, and then there's a, another renewed rebel offensive in December and January of, uh, of this past winter, in which uh, the rebels initially wanted to take control of the remainder of these two, two provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk. What they ended up capturing was uh, Donetsk Airport, as well as this pocket um, in Ilovaisk, uh, actually, and uh, Debaltseva, which is where, uh, uh, right between, kind of the, at the midpoint between Donetsk and Luhansk, it's a major railroad crossing. Uh, if you control that, that, that crossing, you uh, reduce the travel time from Donetsk to Luhansk by several hours. Um, and then eventually the rebels closed. Um, the, the, uh, the, the cauldron, they overtook that territory, and now what you're seeing is a second Minsk ceasefire agreement, um, which has been in force ever since. And since then, the front line has remained relatively static. As you probably see, there are a few territories that, um, that are still contested, um, a couple of small cities changing hands every now and then. But overall, uh, the level of violence has gone down with the exception of a small spike uh, as you see there toward the end in, uh, in, in June, uh, some artillery duels happened there and there, was there were serious concerns that it would, uh, it would flare up again into another large rebel offensive. That has not happened. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to the next slide because it kind of keeps going like this for a while. But that's, a, but, but that, that's essentially, the, um, that's essentially the, the, the distribution of control as it currently stands. This is the uh, distribution of violence over the entire uh, period of the war. Um, so far, actually, this goes until the end of uh, the end of July. We're currently collecting data uh, to bring us up to the present. But I want to talk about some of the main drivers of the violence. So, in the early stages of the conflict, during the protest phase and the early insurgency phase, the, the early stages, according to the data, uh, were largely economic. They were not ethnic or linguistic. Um, the strongest predictor of of, of violence on the ground in, the, in these early stages. Violence is most likely and most intense in municipalities that are either heavily dependent on trade with Russia or that were uniquely exposed to um, trade shocks or other types of economic negative shocks uh, due to either the EU association agreement uh, or Russian import substitution. And so these are mainly machine building company towns, basically uh, towns where the, almost everyone is employed in a single factory that exports uh, locomotive engines to one customer, Russian railroads. Um, and you, we saw a lot of the same things happen in coal mining towns. Uh, those towns switched sides very early in the conflict and they, uh, and they switched sides for the most part without a shot being fired. They did not resist the pro-Russian separatists uh, when they moved in and took control over these towns. So contrary to the way this conflict has been portrayed both in the Russian press and in the Western press, this is not an ethnic conflict. And if there's one point that I want you to take away from tonight, it is that. 
uh, Russian language and ethnicity and how many Russian speakers reside in a given town does not predict violence. Trust me, I've, I've run thousands, literally thousands of, of predictive models on this. It, it, it does not come out as significant. Uh, the only instances in which uh, Russian language does predict rebel control are in towns where these economic incentives were not very strong, where there's not a, a large industrial workforce. And as uh, Ukrainians, of course, know, there are Russian speakers on both sides of this war, and there are many more of them on the pro-Kiev side. Um, and of course, there are, in the later stages, uh, when we transition away from protests and insurgency and into full-spectrum maneuver war, the causes of the fighting have ch um, changed a little bit. Um, and this may seem somewhat tautological, but the best predictor of violence is violence. Right? And what I'm talking about here is artillery duels. So rebels uh, launch an artillery barrage against government firing positions. Government and, um, and volunteer battalions respond. Rebels respond in turn. And this, after this artillery return, other units on the front line are being placed on alert, and similar things spread out throughout the territory. And that kind of self-perpetuating dynamic is the main driver of violence over this entire period. And compounding this, this problem is our basic problems of command and control on both sides. There are simply too many actors on the ground, and too many of them are not within the command structure of either the Ukrainian government or the Russian armed forces, or even uh, the self-proclaimed People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. And of course, on the Ukrainian side, uh, we have a lot of volunteer battalions. Um, some of them in the early stages of the war were uh, formed out of self-defense uh, protest uh, units uh, in the Euromaidan from Kiev. Um, they took up arms. Some of them, like D the Dnipro 1 Battalion on, uh, that was financed by, uh, Ika, uh, the, by um, Kolomoisky, the governor of, of Dnipro Petros, basically worked like a private army. Um, it's basically a private militia uh, run by a warlord. Uh, some of them have an openly uh, nationalist right-wing agenda. Some of them, like the now disbanded Idar Battalion, have been accused of human rights violations. Um, most of them at this point have been now subordinated to, to, to the Ministry of the Interior, but that of course has not prevented the kinds of things that we saw last week. Um, even though they're formally within the command structure of the Ukrainian government, they're still very much autonomous actors. Um, and all of that of course pales in comparison to the problems on the pro-rebel side. On the pro-rebel side, uh, in addition to locals, uh, basically lo local units formed out of either uh, French political parties in Donetsk and Luhansk, or from uh, former uh, coal mining uh, labor unions. Uh, we also have a lot of volunteers from Russia, a lot of ultra-nationalists from Russia, a lot of Cossack mercenaries, a lot of Chechen mercenaries who no one really controls. Uh, again, a lot of these units have been sub now subordinated to the so-called armed forces of Novorossiya, um, but they retain a lot of autonomy, and there's no real switch that Putin can, can flip to turn off the violence at any given point. And that's so once violence breaks out, it becomes very difficult to contain in this kind of environment. We have so many third-party spoilers. And then, of course, what, what also predicts violence is uh, simple matters of ge geography and logistics. It's hard to fight, it's hard to fight in, a, in, a, in a town that you cannot access through roads. Um, the closer you are to the Russian border, uh, the more supplies you'll receive from Moscow and so on. Um, now I want to talk about why violence has declined if, if, we, do, if we indeed think that it has declined. Um, and in fact, it goes up and down, but relative to, this, to the uh, very intense level of activity that we saw last, uh, last August and, and, and last January, it has declined. One, one potential argument is that the ceasefire is working. Um, but as you can see right there, after MISC-1 and MISC-2, it's really hard to make that argument. Um, in general, this, this case study uh, it very nicely illustrates the fact that countries do not, combatants do not stop fighting because of a ceasefire. They sign a ceasefire because they want to stop fighting. And as we saw in, in MISC-2, before MISC-2, that agreement happened because the rebel winter offensive failed. They initially wanted to take control of Mariupol, of Kramatorsk, of Slavinsk, uh, the entire territories of Donetsk and Luhansk. They failed. They captured the airport. They captured this railroad crossing into Balsava, and they could not take any more territory without a huge increase in Russian military support, uh, Russian armored units going across the border, which Putin did not have any appetite for at the time. So ceasefire success, not really. Perhaps the sanctions are working. Well, they are and they aren't. Uh, if you look at Putin's approval rating, they have not made a dent. I think right now he's at about 90%. Um, and 
there's also logic, a very flawed logic in how these uh, sanctions have worked. The, the way that um, the way that sanctions work is if you have compliance on the other side, if the, uh, if the side that is being sanctioned has an opportunity to comply, and if the condition of these sanctions is get out of Crimea, no Russian leader, Putin or anyone else, can do that without losing power. Um, he'll have to run out of the country like Yanukovych did in Ukraine. Um, and so there's a sense in Russia that these sanctions are there to stay. Um, there's also the question of Russian operations in Syria, uh, whether they are in fact a big distraction from, uh, from the fighting in Ukraine, get Ukraine off the front line uh, of, of the newspapers, get Russia back into the negotiating table, and certainly they have had this effect. Uh, but the military opportunity costs of these operations in Syria are actually very small. Um, here, here we're talking about basically um, um, <clears throat> 34 fighter jets, um, a few ground attack helicopters, uh, some Marines to protect the base, air crews, uh, combat service personnel, no, all of units that are not used in Ukraine, where the fighting is mainly done by mechanized units uh, on the ground. And, but I think the main reason that why violence has gone down, if it has gone down, is there are many more stakeholders now in the status quo uh, than there were previous, previously. And by stakeholders, I mean primarily at the official level, Poroshenko, Putin. Um, from Putin's standpoint, now in Ukraine we have a frozen conflict which is essentially a veto on NATO integration for Ukraine, where he can flip up, he can turn up the heat whenever he wants. But also on Poroshenko's side, um, I mean, Ukraine is a 50-50 country electorally. Uh, traditionally, that's been the case for most of the election cycles. So is the US. Now imagine if California or Texas secedes, right? What will that do to the outcome of presidential elections? If California secedes, what will that do uh, to the probability that Democrats will win in the national election? Um, and, and, and of course, there are also some, uh, some fiscal savings that come into play. You didn't have to pay the salaries of state workers in Ukraine for a while, uh, not since last summer. But of course, those fiscal uh, saving costs have now been completely offset by the increased military spending. But still, uh, reintegrating Ukraine is much more costly than um, potentially uh, just keeping the status quo intact. But of course, the people who are not real stakeholders in the status quo are the locals. The rebels on the ground in Donetsk and Luhansk, and also a lot of the volunteer battalions. And so I'm actually going to fast forward from this slide straight to the conclusion. Um, how do we keep this violence down? And so particularly during the flare-up of violence last winter, there's been a lot of talk about sending US military aid to, to the Ukrainian armed forces. And the people in manning these kinds of static positions uh, in an open front um, basically facing uh, armored units on the, on, on the Russian and the rebel side, uh, certainly want anti-tank munitions, uh, anti-tank guided missiles. That's been a main request that they have. Um, and the problem here is that U.S. military aid to Ukraine, the idea is, is that it will deter the rebels from any future offensives. But the problem is that it's kind of paradoxically is both too much and too little. Um, it's too little to change the balance of power on the ground. Um, military experts, those who have been following the unfolding events on the battlefield, know that Ukraine's military defeat is not due to any deficiencies in technology. It's due to poor logistics, inexperienced commanders, uh, a lot of difficulty uh, <clears throat> maneuvering battalion and brigade sized units in the field, uh, due to poor intelligence, and a uh, complete breakdown of command and control between the regular army and uh, these volunteer battalions, and injecting sophisticated weapons into, the, into, into this kind of operating environment is very risky. I'm not going to mention the fact that vol the Javelin missiles are about a quarter million dollars each, um, and, um, and it would also entail U.S. training personnel being on the ground in harm's way. Uh, so if we want U.S. troops on the ground in Donetsk, that's a potential strategy we, we can take, uh, but it fundamentally won't change the balance of power on the ground. Um, a key to any kind of conflict resolution will be to keep third-party spoilers in check on both sides. Um, and partly this is a problem of the Russian zone making. Um, their most uh, capable units, the Russian army has gone through an entire restructuring in, in, in the past, past 10 years. They've increased their reliance on professional soldiers, on, on what they call kontraktniki, uh, contract personnel. Uh, but but that's, that mainly applies to specialized units, uh, technical units such as armor, uh, artillery, 
uh, airborne, that does not apply to infantry. Infantry is mainly conscripts, and they have mothers who complain when, they're, uh, when their sons are sent to battle. So Russia has relied on third parties, like a lot of locals, a lot of mercenaries. These people are hard to control. And, and Ukraine has also had a similar problem, but mainly due to the fact that at the beginning of the, of, of the conflict, they only had 6,000 combat-ready troops. So we need to keep these third party spoils in check. I don't know how. Um, hopefully someone will figure that out. Now, also the current economic blockade of Donbass is kind of productive. Um, if we want to increase the reliance of the 4 million people who live there, who have not yet fled, on Russia, if you want to increase their reliance on humanitarian aid from Russia, go ahead, keep them blockaded. Uh, this is not the best idea if we want to eventually reintegrate these territories into Ukraine. But the bottom line is that you, Kiev needs to create an attractive political econ economic model in the territories that it controls. Uh, it needs to create incentives for the people who live in the Donbass to look to Kiev, in, to see their future in Kiev rather than in Moscow. Um, of course, this is the same prescription that, uh, that was recommended for Georgia and for Moldova. It did not really unfreeze those conflicts, but I think this is a, pro this is a, a strategy for generations. This is not something we can implement in two or three years. The problem is the long term, but that's where we currently are. Thank you for your time. You know, there's an advantage to speaking last and a disadvantage. Uh, one of the advantages is I could just say ditto and we could have a discussion. Uh, because I agree with their number of points of view, but I agree that uh, all of them are valid based on research, based on history. Some of them are educated guesses. I'm going to take off my professorial robe and put on a diplomatic sh uh, ambassadorial sash for a minute and try to be a hard-boiled realist about this issue, because I think it's important uh, not to, let us say, from the standpoint of the U.S. government, also I can't speak for the, uh, for the European Union, but from, at least from the standpoint of the U.S. government, you, the situation in Ukraine has to be put into a much broader framework. And one of the questions in that broader framework is, what are the Russians up to? What are their national interests? Are there parallel interests with ours? Are there conflicting interests with ours? Can we have a grand dialogue with them because it certainly doesn't pay for us or for the Russians to have another Cold War begin. It's more expensive, it's dangerous. There are all the reasons uh, that uh, we fought for 70 uh, some years. Uh, well, I wouldn't say 70 years, but at least after the, after the Second World War uh, to uh, contain the Soviet, the Soviet Union at the time. And that was my period of time in government. I have to say, when I served in Moscow in the 70s, I visited Ukraine several times. And uh, one of the things I took away from that was that the KGB surveillance at the time was much heavier in Ukraine than in Moscow. It was much heavier than any place I've been. It kind of is an indication of the mutual distrust on both sides. Um, and the, the idea uh, one might call paranoid, but you know what Henry Kissinger or somebody said about paranoia, paranoids, they said even paranoids have enemies. Um, <laughs> so the sense, the sense that, um, there, uh, that Ukraine was different because it was an important part of the Soviet Union. Big population, you know, the uh, breadbasket, so-called, of the, of the Soviet Union, et cetera. It's an important, uh, it's, it was an important country. But I think, so I think we want to put this into the context of U.S. national interest, U.S. strategy. I think the Russians, under Putin especially, have been very strategic in what they've been doing. And I think Ukraine fits into this strategic fame, framework. What are, what are Russian national interests as we try to predict them from, from outside? First, and this has been mentioned before, they want to rebuild respect and fear. I put those two together. Respect and fear of the kind that the USSR, that the Soviet Union had uh, during the Cold War before, right? They want, uh, and Putin particularly, when I say they, it's not just Putin. It's a, it's a ruling elite, of the, what one might have called the nomenclatura during, during Soviet days. They want to be included in all the big boys clubs, and um, 
to be included in decision making uh, in important world events. Um, part of the problem with this is that they also are a controlling factor in terms of the way the West deals with events. It's, a, it's, a, it's very much a tactic that goes back to Soviet days. First, you cause a problem. Then you make sure that you are involved in the solution. So if you cause the problem, you're involved in the solution, you have to, be, you have to discuss at the very highest level, the G8, uh, with the European Union, with the United States. It's, uh, Russia certainly sees uh, its uh, foreign policy overseas as a kind of control factor internally as well. It's been very popular. Um, you know, this is an old, an old tactic of not just the Soviet Union, but Russia. You create uh, issues on the outside that require you to take certain controls internally uh, because they're disruptive to the stability of the state. And I think we have seen certainly a number of examples uh, of that in terms of the press, uh, various uh, trials uh, uh, that have gone on in, in, uh, in Russia. And in terms of Russia's strategic view, I think it's very clear that Putin and his group view the West, but primarily the United States, as wavering, undecided, weak, and war-weary. And that is an, so if you're thinking from the standpoint of a, 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 a Soviet policymaker, you take that into account, it gives you an open area in terms of what one can do to build influence worldwide. And I'm, I'm sure that, that, that this seems to be the case. Now, one example of this was the so-called red line. So President Obama drew a red line, chemical weapons, et cetera. Uh, then it was violated, pretty clearly violated. Then he said, I have to go to Congress. And then the Russians, seeing this wavering, came in and there was a negotiation. And here we are, back again. My own personal view, nobody would agree with this. I think when the red line was crossed, we should have strategically bombed several places, as, as much as we can, not civilian installations, but military, to show that we had will resolve and that we could be depended upon. Because I think from the standpoint of the, the Russians now, that was a, a watershed. They saw that we were not willing to use force or to, and, and use force I don't mean by sending troops into Ukraine, but at least arming Ukrainians, going, f uh, trying to persuade NATO to do more, et cetera. Okay, so I think the elements of, of Russian strategic doctrine now are first, build the armed forces, expand their reach on land, sea, and air. This seems to be happening. If you look at the number of incidents now where Russian uh, aircraft have uh, come close to the national territory of NATO members and other Scandinavians especially, and where their ships, uh, particularly in the north, are, seem to be in a probing uh, expedition with submarines that are detected as well, um, it's clear that um, not only are they building the armed forces back again, but they're also using, using them for strategic purposes and for signaling purposes in terms of not only what their intentions are, but what their, what their, uh, their resources are and what their possibilities are. Since we have been looking at Russia as a, a weakened, uh, weak country ourselves since the end of the Soviet Union, particularly during the Yeltsin period, when we kept saying, oh, we want Russia to be a normal country, which I always thought was a kind of strange expression on our part. But in any case, also, the, um, from the standpoint of the sanctions, which were discussed here, um, it's clear, uh, if, and if you look at Russian history as well, it's, it's clear that things like sanctions actually lift the popularity of the particular leader. Uh, this, is what's happened with, uh, this is what's happened with Putin, because the argument is here, we, this, our, our potential enemy is making more difficult for you to live. That's a good excuse for not having a very high standard of living. In fact, for a, it's the outside that's doing this, not us. If they understood our motives and, in a way, our own ideology, then this wouldn't be happening to you. So it's a control mechanism. And the idea is to denigrate the, uh, the effect of the um, sanctions, but realistically trying to also get them taken off at some point, find some conditions for doing this. Then there's this issue that was discussed here before as well. Reestablish, and this has been going on for some time, it's not new, reestablish hegemonic relations with a number of uh, near abroad countries, uh, 
and also not just through what I would say peaceful means, but also by showing that what the, what the consequences of <clears throat> challenging Russian uh, interests would be. Well, we've seen, this in, we've seen this in Georgia, we've seen it in Ukraine. Syria is, in a way, the same kind of thing. There, first place, there are a lot of Russians in Syria. A lot of Russians over the years have, and a lot of uh, Syrians who live in R Russia who have married Russians in one way or another since they've had these military installations. Uh, and so getting back into this strategic framework, Syria fits in, ver Syria fits in very nicely. So hegemony by reestablishing some of the relationships with the former republics, as well as the threat of using force, as they have. They've already shown that they can. And then you have um, a number of places where we don't, this doesn't make the newspapers very much, but where we have Russian troops already. So I looked this up. And if you look at, for example, Armenia and the whole issue of Nagorno-Karabakh, which the Russians have, where the Russians have supported Armenia very strongly. There are about 5,000 Russian personnel there, but besides that, the Russians are clamping down on, on uh, Armenians in terms of their ability to maneuver. Belarus, there are personnel in Georgia, and both Abkhazia and, uh, and South Ossetia. Uh, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,500 Russian troops. In the, the old, in the stands, this is Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Tajikistan, we have Russian troops and Russian influence increasing. And of course, Syria, we have it now, Ukraine. And there's even been, a, um, even been an agreement signed recently to reestablish some kind of relationship with, Viet with Vietnam, because they had a base at, Com they had a base at Kamran Bay during the Vietnam War. And in addition to that, the Russians have been playing the China card. This is our old China. Man, they stole our strategy. They've been playing the China card in a way that's, I think, quite clever, um, showing that uh, because China and the United States and uh, our allies have been having problems with freedom of, freedom of the seas, with the building of these islands, it's a perfect time for Russia to try. Chinese suspect Russian history, history will tell you that there's a lot of suspicion between the two countries. But, you know, realistically speaking, it's not a bad deal for Russia and China to have a closer relationship, and I think this is what's what's happening. So how do we relate this to the Ukraine? This will, and what, could, what can the United States possibly do that will increase its own national interest? Let me address that a little bit. So it is true. Syria has moved Ukraine to the back pages. I don't know if, that's the, um, if that was the reason for moving it. I doubt it. There was a broader reason to establish that big boy image and show that, there, they have, that the Russians have uh, interests in the Middle East and need to be part of whatever solutions, whatever negotiations uh, take place. Um, the question of Crimea. So Crimea has become basically a fact of life. Uh, you said it, uh, it's been mentioned here before, there's no Russian leader that could possibly say, OK, well, let's negotiate. Maybe we can figure out a deal or they'd have more autonomy. It's not going to happen. It's going to be part of Russia. And there's not gonna, there are some consequences they could pay, but it's not going to go back. You know, Ronald Reagan even said the Panama Canal, it's ours, we built it, and we're going to keep it, and we didn't keep it. Uh, don't think the Russians are going to do it that way. Uh, in any case, the thing that's happened most recently, which I think is in, in, uh, in, uh, in interesting, is Putin, so Putin made a, um, just a short time ago a, a speech in which he basically showed the softer part of this doctrine, that is the doctrine that is the incentive. And he said, essentially, look, we can work with our partner. He always calls us partners with our partners in the West. Um, we, so what's going on here? We can, presumably, the, we can negotiate on the, Syria is, on the Syria issues, as long as we don't have to stay with Assad, that sort of sub rosa going on. Uh, but he needs to be there while we're negotiating. And in Ukraine, you need us, quite obviously. We can talk about that as well. So there is, this is a very clever policy of using the fist and using the fist in the velvet glove, I think, that's coming on. Now, so just briefly, what can the United States do? First place, there are some bit, very big US national interests going in. We do not want the policy established. Even, and remember, there's a, um, there's a bit of inconsistency here, but as someone once said, 
Uh, foolish inconsistency is the hobgoblin of a small mind. So, uh, foolish, sorry, foolish consistency, I said it wrong. Foolish consistency is a hobgoblin of a small mind. So it seems to me there are several things that can be done which make sense and which fit in even into the o Obama administration foreign policy and national security strategy, which personally I don't admire very much, but it, you know, we have a president, and so let's look at what things could be done. First place, it's very important to keep the allies united on sanctions. That's going to be very hard to do. Um, you need to make Ukraine, I think, part of the overall dialogue with Russia. You cannot handle it separately. It needs to be part of that overall dialogue and part of the deal. Call it a grand bargain if you want, but it has to fit into it. Because if it's handled separately, I don't think we will we'll get very far. We need to keep the sanctions in place, as I said, and we need to keep the allies there. We need, however, we also need to make clear to the Russians what needs to be done to reduce the sanctions. I think they have had a, a ma they certainly have a major effect in terms of investment, capital flight. Uh, you can see this in the figures and in the economy in general. Um, we need to demand that the Russians not pull out whatever they are, volunteers, mercenaries, Russian forces, out of Ukraine. And we need to be careful about Crimea. So there are some things we could do about Crimea, but we need to be realistic about what can be done, I think. It's not going back to, uh, to Ukraine. I think that's just unlikely. The example I would give is when I, when I, when I served in Moscow, but during that whole period of time, you know, the, we never recognized the forceful incorporation of the Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. There's an advantage in keeping that principle going. It can be even toughened because you can do something like we did with Cuba in the Helms-Burton Amendment, where you put a notation of the passport not valid for, for travel to, to Crimea. Uh, you can punish um, Crimean officials uh, by making sure they, they can't travel, they can't, um, uh, they can't have visas, they can't get to the United States, freeze their money. You can be very tough on that. I'm not sure that will get anywhere, given what I think are Russian attitudes toward maintaining control over Korea, but, uh, of Korea, <laughs> Crimea. Um, okay, so then we, it, within this grand dialogue, we need to press for a so, more solid cease, ceasefire and a negotiations between the parties. I think it's the Ukrainians that need to, to solve this, and it needs to be solved without the pressure from either East or West, but particularly from East. Um, then we have to, I think, come up with an economic package for Ukraine to show the advantages of um, working with the West. I'm not sure that it should include membership or associate membership with the EU, but something, um, but a, an economic assistance package certainly is, is important, particularly on balance of payments issues. Uh, even uh, preferences in trade, like what we have in the general system of, of preferences with a number of underdeveloped countries, there's no reason why it couldn't be applied to Ukraine at all. Uh, at all. And uh, we need to have, uh, and this is the last point I want to make, we need to have a very strategic dialogue and talks with the Russians about the full range of issues that we uh, both agree on, there aren't many of them at this point, but, and that we disagree on, because that relationship is important. The Russians are aggressive. They're forward-leaning, as, they, as we say sometimes, and it's not going to, and it's not going to stop. Uh, I think some results can be had, but I think the negotiation themselves and the, the image of negotiating with what is a potential important adversary um, is very important in, it, in, it, in and of itself. So that's what I have to say, and thank you all for participating in this. Thank you all also for offering us a number of good questions to choose from. I'm going to pass the microphone to Will Lamping, and he's going to select a representative sample of your questions. Right. Our first question is for Ronald Suni, but of course all the panelists are welcome to weigh in on it. You discussed the Western and Russian narratives of what has happened and is happening in Ukraine. What is the Ukrainian narrative? Are there any differences between the Western and Ukrainian narratives? It seems to me there's several Ukrainian narratives. I mean, if you include uh, Donetsk and Luhansk as well in that, right? Or do you mean the, 
Maybe the questioner meant, what is the Ukrainian narrative in, on, on the other side? And I think the best, the best answer for that would probably be to have, have uh, Yaroslav answer that question rather than I, because uh, I, what, what I see is, is real, in my mind, confusion and conflict among different actors, different political parties. I don't think uh, there's a very consistent single uh, narrative, but I leave that to you. I do agree, but I see it's a kind of advantage for Ukraine because nobody has a monopoly. There is no single unit dominating narrative in Ukraine, period. You could, if you're talking about Ukraine, it's better always just plural than singular, so to say. And I believe there's the beauty of Ukraine in a sense because otherwise if nobody's dominating, you have a country which has to come some deals, agreements, and that's basically it's what the democracy is about. All right, thank you. Uh, for Professor Zhukov, given the early stage insurgency and the currently more conventional combat of this hybrid war, is military victory by either side feasible? Um, is, and if so, what, what might that, who is likely to win? So the military balance on the ground uh, strongly favors the Russian side. Um, and, and I should say the pro-Russian rebel side. Um, but the, 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 way that, the way that it works is that rebels without Russian support are capable of holding territory. They're not capable of taking territory. Uh, they're capable of manning static defensive positions. They're not capable of penetrating through the Ukrainian defenses, which at this point are pretty well fortified. Um, if the situation does not change on the ground, um, I would say it would, we'll, we'll see continued stalemate and we'll see a general, general freezing of the conflict along the lines that it is currently on. If Russia chooses to, to intervene much more forcefully, we can potentially see uh, deeper penetration within, um, within the, these two provinces. It's a great tank country. Um, and, and if once the Russians get past the Ukrainian defenses, there's very little stopping them uh, as they roll right across all the way to the Dnieper River. But, um, but currently, I think the most likely scenario is a continued stalemate. Okay. And this uh, question is open to the, the entire panel. Is there a chance of a similar conflict um, breaking out either from a f current frozen conflict or in another former Soviet state? And if so, could you speak to the, uh, the, the danger for regional instability stemming from the, the current conflict in the Donbass? Well, maybe I might just say a word. So remember the Brezhnev Doctrine. Brezhnev Doctrine basically was that the Soviet Union had the right to intervene in any country, and we're talking about there, the Warsaw Pact countries essentially, that uh, threatened socialism. It was a broad point. So um, I, I respect what you said about uh, Russian speakers and ethnicity, but the first thing that Putin basically said was that Russia had a responsibility for protecting Russians and Russian speakers wherever they were, right? It's, that is a pretty important doctrine if you think of the Baltics, for example, where you have numbers of, you know, upwards of 30 percent and so and, long, and more in some of the Baltic, uh, Baltic countries. So in terms of um, uh, what principles that we need to, to, uh, to um, uh, fortify, uh, and support, I would say we need to get away particularly from the idea that a country can invade a neighbor for what are essentially, I guess in this case, linguistic and ideological uh, reasons or ethnic, or ethnic reasons. You know, part of the problem is that, uh, part of the problem and part of the good thing that's happened uh, post-war, particularly in the last 10 years or so, is this idea of the responsibility to protect. So the responsibility to protect says if a dictator is abusing his own people, the United Nations has the right to do something about it under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. So, you see, so the Russians, in effect, have flipped this around a little bit. There's a sort of responsibility to protect Russians. We can't allow that to happen because that will have dire circumstances in terms of our own values and in terms of our strategic interests, it seems to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And this one. I, I, I don't sure. think that's serious. That is, uh, I think that's rhetorical. That is, they make that claim. They, Yeltsin made this claim, by the way, originally. Um, but it, it's never acted on, really. And there, even when there were real abuses of Russians in Estonia, uh, uh, most importantly, they didn't act on it. 
And most Russians in the Baltic countries prefer to live in those nice Baltic countries, higher standard of living and all that, than they do in Russia. So there's no, there's no push from Russian diaspora in those countries, which in the last 20 years, there's some work on this, have become increasingly identified as a separate nationality almost, as a diaspora Russian people living abroad. So I don't think this is that real a problem. And it, you know, clearly a place like Kazakhstan, where there are lots of Russians and Russian speakers in the north, might worry about this. But the Russian the government so has not made the serious moves like that. They can use it rhetorically. Yeah, and I, my, my comment was not made to say, it was not meant to say that it was the diaspora that was asking for the Russians to come in, but that the Russians were using the diaspora as a reason and could use it in other places. It's a, sig a kind of signaling device. Be careful. Uh, that's, anyway. So if I can weigh in briefly, I think, uh, I, guess, I guess I'm more on, on Ron's side of this, uh, of this question, because I think the main difference between the Baltic states and the Donbass is the local component is not there. Because the Baltic states, as Ron said, has, is, should be a most likely case mm -hmm. for, for, a, for an ethnic Russian uprising uh, because they are treated in some of those countries as second class citizens. Uh, but the economic component is not there. The, the, what makes Donbass unique and what I think makes a similar uprising unlikely in both any other part of uh, Ukraine but also any other part of the Soviet Union is because in Donbass you have a concentration of industries that are almost completely dependent on trade with Russia. And by imp implementing this import substitution scheme that, that Russia has, has had going since even before your, the Yovar Maidan, um, they have put the pressure on that particular, the most vulnerable, the most economically vulnerable part of the Ukrainian population. Russia does not have that kind of leverage in the Baltics. Okay. Thank you. And this next question actually speaks directly to um, changing identities and perception of identity, uh, specifically in Ukraine. Uh, Professor Hritsak, uh, you claim that in order for Ukraine to reform the younger generation, uh, in order to, for reform, the younger generation needs a chance to mature, to act freely, uh, to act freely without the memory of the Soviet past. Uh, if you could uh, speak to this, how would you propose that this opportunity should be provided? See, the last, I have, I have never the last sentence. Said could, you, um, could you propose, um, how would you go about providing this opportunity? To change identity. To, cha uh, to allow for the, to the generation uh, free of the Soviet there past. Is whole, uh, thank you so much. There is a whole uh, discourse emerging for the last, I would say, seven, eight years. Since uh, the time it was evident the Orange Revolution has failed, the, the Yushchenko and Tymoshenko would deliver any reforms. So it will be like a uh, new discourse emerging of the, say, third way, this called Third Ukraine, which is basically bilingual, neither of Galicia nor Donbass, and very much, so, so to say, pro, 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 pro Western. Just give you one idea, this will come closer to, to, to what, to what uh, just had been said. Uh, a year ago or so, a blogger in Odessa, a rather famous one, has suggested to uh, accept the Russian language in Ukraine officially as a separate large Russian language, as a separate language. The way like American and British language are treated, um, British English language in Britain and England. And the reason he says basically that uh, in Ukraine, the Russian language in Ukraine is very much different, even in vocabulary. Okay, I won't judge that. To what extent is it different? But say, but his main argument was because in in, in Ukraine, the Russian language is a language of European choice mm. and liberty, so to say. So what I'm saying here, I'm not claiming this is true or, or wrong. I'm claiming this is new, new, so to say, new discourses emerging, which try to bridge their kind of division and to put some kind of third way. And very importantly, they uh, how should I put it? They don't pay that much on historical memory. This is very interesting. On, on issues which are most vulnerable, which is language and historical memory. Because if you want to have Ukraine be divided, talk about historical memory, particularly about Second World War, and talk about language. Then have initial divide. But you start talking about different things, like a corruption, like an efficiency of the government, you have a different country. So I'm saying this, this is now attempt. I know it was a success or fail, but at least there is attempt. It's visible in public discourse to reformulate. So to say, they call it from identity to values. Say from identity, identity-based discourses to the values-based discourses. And I would say, again, nobody has done some kind of studies, but there are some studies that we now 
we know, probably it's wishful thinking, but still, there are some, studies, there are some claims along this line, kind of studies, a hypothesis, that what we're witnessing now in Ukraine is a demise of identity politics and identity discourses. I know what would be the results, but still I'm saying what is there. Thank you very much. Um, and speaking of uh, Ukrainian public discourse, uh, recently Ukraine uh, banned communist symbols um, within the public sphere. Um, given this and the rise of right-wing uh, battalions um, fighting on the side of Ukraine in the Donbas conflict, is there a seri is there a serious risk of a rise of right-wing politics, potentially fascism, in reaction to Russian intervention in Ukraine? There is, and this very serious has been taken seriously. It could be disregarded, so to say. And I would say, but I uh, say, having said that, and actually, uh, Russia, Russia uh, behavior, Russian aggression, if you will, increases the chances, for obvious reason, for this kind of issue. But it's interesting. So far, we are not witnessing this decrease when it comes to the uh, voting and the surveys. There are certain niche in Ukraine, which is filled with kind of the extremist. I mean, they vote in constituency. It's more or less the same. It's more or less the same. And importantly, I probably know that fact, but still it makes sense to reiterate it. After the, over, after the Euromaidan during presidential elections and the parliamentary elections, right-wing parties felt just, you know, brilliantly, so to say, I may say this word. You know, they, they, two leaders, of the, uh, this right-wing movement, which is Chernobok and uh, Jaros, the leader of the, of the uh, private sector, get less voices together combined than the leader of Jewish community in Ukraine during presidential elections. So what I'm saying here, yeah, it has been taken as a risk, but so far we don't see this kind as a real risk. But again, it depends very much on what's going on, what's going on in Ukraine. What, what, what will... What, what, what trend, what, what direction the political crisis in Ukraine will there, because they, they're there, they're sitting on the wings, so to say. All right, and thank you. And I, our last question for uh, this panel uh, has to do uh, more with a, a regional perspective. The United States and Great Britain have not adhered to the elements of the Budapest Memorandum, which was um, put in place to protect, to protect Ukraine, Ukraine and Ukrainian national sovereignty in return for Ukraine um, giving up its nuclear arsenal in the immediate post-Soviet um, period. Has the, how, in what ways has this uh, strengthened um, Putin's strategy with regards to Ukraine? And how has this uh, shaped Ukrainian policies with regard to the conflict? Well, it's, I guess. for one thing, it's, it's added to the image of, uh, of the West not adhering to what the commitments were in agreement. The, the, the deal was a pretty simple one. Ukraine gets up its, uh, you know, this is oversimplifying, Ukraine gives up its nuclear capabilities, although it, ma it kept its missiles, but gave up nuclear uh, capability, and its, and its borders are supposed to be respected. So if that doesn't count anymore, um, again, I'm not saying that you invade as a, as a result of, that, of the breach. On the other hand, that doesn't count anymore. It says something about the resolve and the will of your opponent. You know, Russians are great chess players. And so I think that uh, that figures into the way that they and that, the way that Putin assesses uh, what kind of actions that he feels are in Russian national interest that can be undertaken at a re in a relatively cheap cost. Yeah. So uh, there is interesting twist in Ukrainian uh, political uh, decision making or whatever suggestions that uh, say to treat this deal as a kind of a dealing trade for a trading deal for a, uh, some kind what what was as we said economic economic assistance package. Mm -hmm. So to say, and more specifically, uh, this has come in the discourses, public discourses, a Marshall-like plan for Ukraine, so to say, which is very much treated seriously, specifically by Poroshenko administration since recently year, and they did a lot along these lines, so far they failed, but also they have some support, you probably uh, read this Soros article along this line, you also mind some kind of intellectual in that, but I'm saying here, they're using this kind of as an argument, as a trading deal for the, some kind of economic assistance package because let's face it part of the failure of economic reform is that they are very expensive the reform itself 
There must be some kind of economic, there must be some kind of the budgeting in Ukraine. has no, has a strong deficit, so to say. And the only budget that could come, they're very costly, is the possible, is from the West, whatever it means, Brussels, Washington, Soros, whatever you know, but still, Ukraine better need it. Since we're almost coming to an end, I, I'm going to leave on a more positive or optimistic note. Maybe this will help a little bit. Um, I actually think that Putin is in trouble. And I think he's, he realizes that he's gotten himself into a quagmire. Now, you, you know, there's about 18 dozen books on Putin right now, psychological studies, uh, whether, his kleptocracy, and so forth. So you can almost, from the material, make any Putin you want. <laughs> the way I, I read him, as, as I said, is a realist interested basically in stability and security and wanting in some ways to, as Mel put it so well, playing a bigger role, being one of the boys on the larger stage. Uh, my sense is he must at some point realize, what have I gotten out of this struggle? Okay, I got Crimea. Now I got to pay for that. All right, I got that. And that's making me popular at home. I've had some trouble at home with elections uh, and, and demonstrations. That, that's a good thing. I've got Donetsk and Luhansk. Oh boy, am I going to pay for that? I was hoping through Minsk agreement that Ukraine would pay for that. So there's the second thing. And he can't get out of the situation. He's estranged from Europe. He's estranged from the United States. Things are much more difficult. The economy is not doing well. Uh, and, you know, this is a, a neoliberal guy in terms of his economic policies who wants to be well integrated into the global capitalist system. And this is costing on all kinds of levels. And so I think in some ways he would like to see a way out. And Minsk II, he got a pretty good deal in Minsk II. And he thought maybe if the Ukrainians would push for that, that would be a way out. I don't know what's going to happen. I can't talk about future strategy because I think it's... As Yuri put it, you know, it, maybe it's too early to, to talk about that. But I think that in his own realism, he may come to the realization that he is overreached. And by overreaching, he has actually weakened Russia and weakened his position on the globe. Thank you. Uh, I hope you'll all join me in thanking our panelists for a very nice presentation.